Good afternoon. It is uh, quarter to two. We're here at Fully Booked for the last of the Atomic Sessions. I'll introduce our panel. I will start with the gentleman to my right. Mr. Mike Wellman has just celebrated his 25th year of comic book retailing by opening a store called the Atomic Basement in Long Beach, California. And uh, he used to be associated with the comic bug, but because of political reasons and others, he is uh, now on his own. He's on his own at the Atomic Basement. And prior to comic retailing, Mike has served as a window, wa window washer, paper boy deliverer, janitor at a newsstand, video store clerk, and arcade attendant. But we know him best now as the co-creator of Guns Ablazin, but he's also done a comic book called Gone South and Mac Afro. And he's also worked for um, franchises that we know like Star Trek, World of Warcraft, Battlestar Galactica, uh, Cyborg 009, and many other titles. He's also a 2019 Eisner Award nominee. It's 2017. Oh, sorry. 2017. Sounds and like I yay! work too hard. I work Mike. way too hard. <laughs> yay, Mike. <laughs> yay, I get around, Mike. baby, to the Population last yes. night. Yes. Okay. And to Mike's right is a good friend he has an ma just got your ma no i'm, I'm in the still pro okay in the, the process of, of yeah. getting his ma yeah. in media studies and a film master's. he's a director he has done a music video and film he's been a teacher at benild where we were for the first session he's the front man for stereo deal he's the man behind nerd rage and nerd fest um, oh, and among the, the music videos he's directed, he's directed for uh, The Dawn, for Jet Pangan, for True Faith, and Mr. Eli Buendia. And, um, well, he got into, uh, well, no, he will answer that. Maybe I'll start with, uh, with Mike. Okay, yes, we'll start with start Adrian. With me? What? Okay. Um, so how did you get, it? what is your foot in the door of the geek world? I, I think it was your, your mom introduced you to Superman. Yeah, um, when I was a kid, my mom exposed me to a lot of Superman stuff, Spider-Man, Star Wars. Um, the first movie I ever remember going to was Return of the Jedi in Green Hills. Uh, I think that's 1983. 83, yes. 83, yeah. And the first, that I think the only thing I remembered from that movie was Jabba the Hutt eating that little thing. And for some reason, it, it left a mark. <laughs> In, in, in my head, and then my mom started giving me these Star Wars pop-up books and all that. And I started, and I was, at the same time, I was reading Spider-Man comic strips back when it was still at the Daily Daily Express. Oh my God, it's pop culture heaven at that time because all of a sudden these cartoons started coming out, He-Man, Thundercats, and all that. I watched every day. So being into those things, I guess, has been, uh, I, I guess, a passion of mine, like like a lot of people from my generation. Um, but um, along the way, I got exposed to Superman, of course, because I think my mom worked on a Superman TV special here when they were promoting Superman 3. I think it was for Channel 9. Uh, my mom is, uh, is a script writer and an events producer, but at the time she was doing the scripts for a lot of TV specials. So, of course, well, I, I, I saw that she had Superman material lying around, so when she was asleep, I take a look at her uh, tapes and, um, and uh, whatever Superman material she had. So, yeah, um, I got a lot of, I, I, start, I started getting into that stuff via partly osmosis, partly exposure uh, due to the zeitgeist uh, of the time. Um, but in terms of getting into the geek community, um, well, the internet happened. The internet happened and I was... Um, I was into chat rooms and uh, Yahoo groups and all that, and, uh, and message boards. And I met people in message boards. Uh, I met Star Wars fans in message boards. And around the time of Attack of the Clones, we decided to form a local Star Wars fan club here called Star Wars Philippines. And uh, we met new friends along so the way. So this was pre-501st? This was pre-501st. This was around 2002. 
And I guess partly envy because uh, we, we saw these magazine articles and videos uh, about fan clubs in the States. And here in the Philippines, when we say fan clubs, or before, when we say fan clubs here, we think of celebrity fan clubs. And we tend to look at those with disdain because they tend to be, it's just too much celebrity. But, but, but uh, when we started forming fan clubs revolving around films, around sci-fi films, um, I guess, I'm not sure if I want to blame it on colonial mentality. Uh, I, I mean, right, we're history. very into our pop culture here. Yeah, we are. We I mean, are. I think yeah. Raf and Mike have noticed, like we... We love it. Yeah, we know our stuff. Yeah. And we argue yeah. about it. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, 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 yeah, um, sometimes I even think that there's really not... Well, these days, I really think there's not much difference between like people like us who are into uh, comics and Star Wars and, and, and Superman and all that. There's not much difference between us and people who form fan clubs around celebrities. It's pretty much the same thing, except that we, we like the genre, not so much the personalities per se. So, yeah, and uh, since then, I've met friends along the way, people like you, Hank, and, and you guys. Okay, and Mike, was it someone in your family that got you? Um, there's the, that got you into like your first comic, and what kind of attracted you to the medium? Yeah, well, so uh, I was born in '73, which means I was five years old, four years old when Star Wars came out, right? And five years old when uh, Superman came out. Uh, but my uncle and my uncle Tom and June. Uh, my cousins, Tommy and Heather, came to visit from Toledo. Uh, this would probably be around 1978. And I remember... So you didn't get to see Star Wars at the cinema? Yeah, I did. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, re I remember some of my first movie memories are Star Wars, Grease, Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, yeah, Hooper. <laughs> Grease. Grease is the word. Um... So, uh, but yeah, my, my uncle bought me a, I remember the one he bought me was Spider-Man 188, which is, a, it's got Spider-Man, like, and it's all a, like a black cover, and he's like coming down on Jigsaw, and he's got his little, like, belt that shoots a light. It's a Spider-Man head. Um, and then Heather got a Wonder Woman comic, and my cousin Tommy got, I think, Ghost Manor, or Ghost Stories, or whatever. It's like a Carlton book. And, uh... That's my first comic book memory, um, and I loved it. Like, uh, you know, like I, I loved my Spider-Man comic. I loved Heather's Wonder Woman comic. I loved Tommy's Ghost Stories comic. So I got to keep all three. I remember my first issue of Star Wars was very unfortunate. It was, it was uh, Star Wars number 16, and it's the only issue of the entire series that like Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Princess Leia, nobody appears in it. Like that, none of them are there. <laughs> it's like it's about a bounty hunter. Like that's. Uh, do you remember that one? Yeah, there's there's like a green rabbit. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a green rabbit. Um, but yeah, Star Wars number six. There is one page in the in in the in the entire issue that kind of like covers the Star Wars movie because that was all that was out at the time. And I love that page, but I was like, where's Luke? <laughs> it's no Luke in here. Uh, but anyway, that was, that was my first Star Wars issue. Um, it's funny because like uh, two days ago, I think it was, Larry Hama sent me a friend request on Facebook. I don't know what the fuck's going on with my Facebook, but like I'm getting all these friend requests. It, people that I don't know, but I'm so desperate for friends and customers that I'm accepting pretty much all of them. Uh, but Larry Hama sent me a friend request, and he wrote G.I. Joe, which was a book I grew up reading. And, and like, so I wrote him back. I, I, I wrote him back. I wrote him. I was like, oh, my God, dude, like, I don't know why you sent me this friend request, but thank you so much. And uh, I guess he's about to go on a promotional tour, so he's kind of reaching out or something. But uh, he did acknowledge my message and wrote back. And... Uh, he even commented on one of my political posts the other day, which was like, huh, that's Which cool. one? Is it some book, Bernie? Uh, it was Trump. an anti-Trump one. It wasn't a, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. I mean, I, I'm trying to be a, frame myself in a more positive uh, light, 
but there's a lot to be negative about. So uh, I'd written something about Trump and I think maybe the coronavirus or something um, and his denial of its existence. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he commented, like, which is, uh, it's kind of cool, like when Larry Hama comments, you know, the writer of G.I. Joe is like, you know, like agrees with, it's, I, I like it that he agrees with me too, but, um, but anyway, I, I think I digressed. Okay. So I'll ask Adrian, how did you start, um, how did it get from you being on a message board to you setting up um, the, you know, setting up Nerd Rage and now making plans for uh, Nerd Fest? I mean, how did it get from there, from the, those chat rooms to big events? Yes. Thank you for that wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I guess it, it started with you know when, when you meet people with sharing common interests, uh, common hobbies. Uh, your group decides to do something together. Whether it's uh, in in my case, um, we started watching Star Wars together, doing activities together, meetups in Starbucks, podium. Um, and then we decided to do activities, and somehow the, 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 the film companies started taking note of our small activities and started getting us to be in their activities or holding exhibits for them, which is, you know, it, it saves them a lot of expenses. Let's, let's face that. So, for them, for the organizers. Yes, yeah, it saves the film companies you know, promotional expenses because there's a fan group. So, yeah, now we started um, putting up, like, I, there's the Star Wars exhibit in 2003, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah. And around the time, um, there were other fan groups that got in touch with us. Uh, there's this guy named Paolo Halbuena, uh, who, was, who at the time was the head of the Star Trek group here in the country. Um, and he proposed to us... Uh, this event called New Worlds, uh, where, wherein it's, it's a banding together of different fan groups and we hold conventions, American style, because prior to that, we never had those things here. Um, the, the closest thing we had to fandom events here would be uh, actor fans days in the malls. So yeah, um, we got together and we held the first New Worlds event at Louis THX back in 2003, um, I wasn't really uh, a bigwig in that event, but uh, I was one of the officers for, for Star Wars Philippines. So we followed suit. And um, I, I guess because I loved what we were doing, I started becoming more active within the Star Wars group. And um, since I happen to be a graphic designer as well, um, I guess other people took note and I got to help out with helping out with, uh, with, with collat uh, posters or whatever. There are other people making posters for the event, but I also helped out there. And um, I, I don't know, because I used to watch my mom do events, I guess um, I got to become, I became interested, again, via exposure to what my mom was doing. So I started helping out with the events proper uh, for New Worlds and um, doing more events for the Star Wars group. And New Worlds went on for around five years. And then it stopped. Um, but, but around that time, since I was also active with my band, I was doing production nights for, for, for band shows in, oh, in the bars here in the country. So, um, yeah, I just did more productions and all that. In, in between, I was doing cosplay because at the time, cosplay was starting to be a thing. And I, I've always wanted to be a Jedi. This is 2003? This was, this was past 2003 okay. already. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to be a Jedi, so uh, since I was already working, I had disposable income, so I could dress up as any Star Wars character I could be. So yeah, and um, I guess constant exposure to events and, and people, and fan groups, different characters, different people with different moods and behaviors, and uh, uh, whether they're the nicest people or the strangest people. And along the way, uh, me and my then future wife, then future because I'm now married to her, we put up a shirt and um, toy uh, shirt and toy business called Geekery, 
So uh, we made fan shirts like this. Uh, a tribute to Dr. Manhattan and Watchmen. So um, I don't know if you could call that copyright infringement, but <laughs> we call it fan shirts. And they tend to be the better looking designs compared to the licensed ones, apparently. So uh, because we had, we had this business, we did it both online and in toy conventions here in, the, in Manila. And we got to meet more people. Uh, there were always the, the, the chatty people dropping by our booth. And there, there was also the strange people. We, we know those types. But regardless of whatever kind of people they were, they were so, I, I, I consider them precious and beautiful because there's always interesting conversations to be had with them. And I realized that the types of people that I used to see in Kevin Smith films were real. So... But wow, it, it's it's great. It's great. Re, it's great connecting with these people. So, parang hey, I got to know more people and all that. And I've seen fandoms come and go because interests come and go. And eventually, I got to connect with a bunch of people who were into Doctor Who. And again, uh, we reconnect. We I, I got to connect with that kind of community. I guess it, you'd call it expansion of interests, and along with that, an expansion of of communities as well. And um, eventually, people started to have a desire to have another kind of Western-type convention. Um, because for the, for the past 20 years, the big conventions here were either ToyCon or Cosplay Mania, which is more anime-oriented. And we thought, hey, maybe there's a need for another Western-type event here. So I got together with the guys from Cosplay Mania and we decided to have a Western format convention called NextCon. And it ran from 2014 to 2016. And uh, our objective then was to ha have this type of convention where it's gonna be panel intensive, like this, that we, where you get to talk to creators, to people, or our audiences get to talk to the creators. So there's this exchange happening. Uh, people uh, interpolate each other. Um, but by 2016, um, there were other bigger events happening. Um, there were the APCCs and other events who had more capital, who had more infrastructure, who had more money at their disposal, and we were a relatively small event. Although in 2016, we got to bring in Casper Van Dien here. But then again, Casper Van Dien goes here often, so, so there's that. Uh, but after that, we realized, okay, we're done. I think we've done our work. Uh, maybe you should rest a bit. Um, let's see how the other bigger events do this. And then the bigger events started disappearing. Right. So, and, and then there was this clamor again for a similar event. And since I was already running Nerd Rage, because yeah, YouTube was a thing, and I wanted to cover, you know, geek interest stories, and we decided, all right, uh, let's put up this channel on YouTube so that um, we could uh, expose people more to this geek culture. And at the same time, we are we're also doing science stuff. So we in a sense it's promoting intellectualism and and and, and the that intellectual lifestyle and uh, not showing that uh, or showing people that it's cool and it's fun and it's interesting. I mean we're all geeks here and we're all intellectuals here. So I wanted to spread that further. So as an extension of Nerd Rage, I decided since people were looking for an event again, I decided to to have nerd fest, and um, unfortunately, because of recent events, um, right. we had to postpone nerd fest indefinitely until such a time that it's healthier again to have big events like this. Right, and healthier. I, That's a good, yeah, a healthier environment because uh, I know with what happened in Green Hills, right, right. You know, then there's new photos of Green Hills, and it's. Uh, um, there was a hostage situation a couple of days ago, and then um, a corona case. Two, two corona two cases. Yes. That's where you right? Close. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Mike, how did it, you know, from North Carolina to L.A., and yeah. now, and now a, sh a shop, <laughs> you know, two it's, shops. What a long, strange journey it's been. Um, so when I lived in North Carolina, I, I mean, I've wanted to be a writer since, you know, young, young age. And uh, I'm gonna give credit to my ex-girlfriend, Samantha, who I grew up with in North Carolina. I met her when I was in eighth grade. Uh, we started dating when I was a senior. 
um, and uh, she had family out in California. So uh, 1996, she moved to California. I still lived in North Carolina with my mom. And uh, she, like, she has a lot of family out here. Or out, we're not there, are we? We're in the Philippines. Yes, sorry, not in <laughs> but, uh But anyway, so uh, yeah, she has aunts and uncles and titas and titos and all that stuff. And um, she did all the legwork of like getting me an internship at 20th Century Fox, where I worked for uh, J. Todd Harris Productions. Uh, they did a movie with Kevin Bacon called Six Miles to China or something like that. I don't know. Six degrees of separation. No, six Ke degrees Kevin of separation. Bacon. No, I'm one degree away. And uh, I answered the phone once and gave Christopher Lloyd directions to a screening. That was cool. Like, how do I get there? You know, and it was, this is Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> so uh, I worked with uh, Tim Daly. Uh, you guys know Tim Daly? He was the voice of Superman. He was on Wings. So I worked for Tim Daly for like a year. And in that year, he got one autograph request from a, a dad and his son. And I had to sign the autograph like it like it would have been easy for him to sign the autograph and send it but he would rather spend time instructing me can you please sign my autograph and send it oh my god <laughs> uh, but anyway that it, hollywood man um that's how i met the mayor of paramount okay. actually yes. uh so yeah i started at fox and then i wound up over at paramount pictures and uh the mayor aaron i'm gonna talk, tell the story aaron Seagal. He was, back then, he was the, uh, the mail boy. So he would show up and he'd be like, mail, and bring the mail. And uh, we bonded over a mutual love of Mike Patton. Uh, always Faith comes, no more. Faith no more, Mr. Bungle. So Aaron actually grew up with Mike Patton. I don't know if you knew this or not. Uh, and so we went to the very first Phantom Mas concert together. And Samantha, the girl that brought me to California, was on that road trip and her, her, we would always fight like a lot, Ralph, you know this. And uh, so Aaron's on this road trip with me and Samantha and he's like, wow, they fight a lot. Maybe I have a chance with this girl. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he's like, yeah, dude, you gotta read my screenplay. You gotta read my screenplay. And I'm like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna read it. You know, like whatever, like, because that was my job. I, I would read screenplays. So my job was I would read scripts and I would do what they call, do you know what coverage is? It's no. like you write a synopsis of what the script is about and then is it good, is it bad, why is it good, why is it bad, is this something we should pursue, uh, what's, what do you, what's the potential budget and all this sort of thing. So I'm like, yeah, I'd be happy to read your script. So <laughs> Aaron brings his, his screenplay in and it's called Mailboy, the motion picture. And it's about him. And he's like on, on set at Paramount. And he works at Paramount and he sent the thing to Fox. No, I, well, <laughs> I started at Fox. I wound up okay, at Paramount, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. And, uh, but yeah, it's called Mailboy, the motion picture. And it's about like some top leading lady who gets kidnapped. And the mailboy at Paramount Studios has to rescue her. <laughs> so, if you knew Aaron, as you, as yes, you know Aaron, yes. you can imagine. Uh, I mean, I thought it was fantastic. So yeah, I, I, uh, I was working for free in Hollywood, and then I got a job at um, Santa Monica Place where I had a billboard, or a, what do they call that? Not a billboard. Uh, a clipboard, yes. And I would ask people to- Thank you, Rod. <laughs> thank you, Rod. Rod's in the house, y'all. I would ask people to take surveys about anything from Captain Morgan's to catch up to whatever and ask way too many questions about like, how's the packaging on this ketchup bottle? Like, what do you think, you know? Um, and so that was one way I made ends meet. And the other way I made ends meet was I got a job at Jeffrey's Comics in Gardena, California. I worked for uh, Jeffrey Patterson, who was a mm -hmm. former porn star slash uh, he, he worked at a... Uh, porn like, star slash comic book geek. Porn star slash comic book geek, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, he, was, he, was, he was awesome. We had a uh, public access show called Comic Book Geeks. On YouTube. Y you've seen some, yes, right? Yes, pre-2000. Um, 
But there's a very special episode with you and Jeffrey and Christopher Dennis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, there's a couple episodes of Christopher Dennis. But yeah, Christopher Dennis was the uh, Hollywood Superman. You mentioned Casper Van Dien. Uh, his wife, Jenny, uh, Jenny Wonder. Jenny Wanger is actually her real name. Uh, is a dear friend of mine. Uh, there was a documentary. You yeah, guys so they check. were here for next. You know Jenny? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a great guy. documentary, Confessions yes. of a Superhero, that you guys should check out. Um, and it's about Chris Dennis and Jenny, and um, you know Chris just passed away, I think, in December. Right. It was right before my grand opening. Right. Yeah. Right. But anyway, so we had kind of lost touch, and uh, we re we reunited at the funeral. So there's a silver lining there, and she was part of our grand opening. Uh, January 18th, and Casper was at my grand opening. Um, and yeah, so they just moved to Florida. So, uh, uh, where were we? what was I thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you're, you know, about, well, I think it's important to mention that you make it a point of having events at your venues to yes. get a community together. To get um, people yeah, I mean, together, the thing is creators like, and gamers. Yeah, I mean, with with comic books, hey, come on down. Um, with comic books, like we we deal in something that you can buy either digitally on Comicsology, or you can buy it online on Amazon or Midtown Comics or whatever. So I am all about experiences, as you know, Karen. Yes. <laughs> No, but like you, I want to create and curate something that you can't order online. You have to go there. You have to be a part of it. And uh, Rod, Rod was one of my first guests at the Atomic Basement. Jay uh, has not been a guest yet, but he will be. But I, I you have his book. Yeah, we have his book. Um, and and I'm about like I I am being a writer creator who. Mm -hmm maybe didn't have as much guidance as I would have liked to have coming up, I like to provide as much of that as I can to aspiring writers, artists, uh, so on and so forth. So every Wednesday night we have the Creator Lab. Um, Raf and I regularly go out and lecture at schools. We did two universities here in the Philippines. Yeah, so it's all about reaching out. And it's about By the way, out. if anyone in the audience wants to interject or has a question, please uh, just alert. Should we talk to Raphael? We should no, just leave him over there. Uh, and just, well, like, we could just he, leave him there. Because he has a solo. He has a solo show. But oh, okay. I mean, a solo after this. You just sit there anyone and look pretty, Okay. It, the, we'll, <laughs> you know what? We'll, we'll, give him the, we'll give him the mic if he has to say um, well, I'm still waiting to be introduced. Oh, okay. Rafael Navarro is <laughs> our award, Emmy Award-winning artist, classically trained in illustration and, and fine art. Rafael works as an animation storyboard artist for major studios. And Go he's on. got a daytime Emmy. His work can be seen on The Batman, Scooby-Doo, Rugrats, Mucha Lucha, Wacky Races, Justice League, Stripperella. Lego's Hero Factory, uh, to name a few, and he is the man behind Sonambulo. And he is also... Well, that's my granddad, by the way. <laughs> he is also uh, Mike's partner on Guns a Blazin. Yes, Rafael Navarro, but um, he'll be here, he will uh, do the next panel, which is on art. Okay. <laughs> so see you soon, folks. So, um, Adrian, I'd like you to describe for our <laughs> viewers and our guests, how do you find the Philippine geek community? I mean, what words would you use to describe them? Passionate? Argumentative? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Close. The, the Filipino geek community is diverse. Uh, it's rich. It gets crazy half of the time. Uh, but I guess that's what happens when you have a very diverse uh, set of fandoms operating within the community because uh, the community here isn't just one homogenous community. It's like uh, a community of many smaller communities and not all of those communities necessarily intersect. Well, right. there, there's a lot of intersection happening. Right. But there's, for example, um, the anime community is its own thing. Um, and with a very specific demographic, um, 
to my observation, uh, the anime community is somewhere along the the middle class to the lower, extreme low middle class um, demographic. Um, the the community who's into comics, um, whether it's local indie comics or even Western pop culture, um, they tend to be from the upper middle class to the what we call the the B market. But I, I hate stratification because there's it's another problematic thing altogether. But um, I guess for the sake of uh, of labeling them in, in our discussion, yeah. Somewhere along the upper B demographic, not necessarily the A demographic, which are the CEOs, the company owners. Those guys own the business. So yeah, um, there's not a lot of intersection between that. But that doesn't mean to say that the the upper middle class isn't into anime. In fact, they are. But um, there was the the community is really passionate in attending, say, cosplay mania or um, best of anime or otaku expo. They tend to be of a different demographic, so um, and they, they have different sets of behaviors. For example, um, here in the Philippines, some anime events are pretty much notorious for having what we call here team labas or team outside. Meaning, yeah, they don't pay the the tickets for the event. They go there to 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 display their costumes just at the entrance or the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah they, they just stay out front and they, they when you ask them why they don't go inside, they say we don't have the money and then you wonder wait you have the money to make the costume. to make the costume, but yeah uh, but but the event is 150 pesos we can't afford it <laughs> and then you start talking to them and you realize they come from the the lower segment of society but it makes you wonder um, the fact that they could they could save up to make a decent costume but not go inside the event makes you wonder what. Their priorities in life are. So uh, at first I was very judgy about them, but then I realized um, they're there to to be with other people. They're, they're, they're not there just to be seen, but they're there to connect. And uh, here in the Philippines, since um, conventions tend to be show type formats um, or uh, market based formats, uh, the actual discourse happens outside in the lobbies where they meet friends where they meet photographers or videographers that would make their costumes become famous and turn them into the next um, celebrity or to the next online celebrity here. Um, in that sense, there's not a lot of difference between the Western pop culture demographic. They tend to be like that too, but they tend to have ways of justifying it. At least, excuse me, in my observation. Um, in, say, uh, events like ToyCon or NextCon, or APCC, there's also the Team Labas people. There's that. But uh, the events are structured in such a way that uh, when you reach a certain point in that event, you really have to pay to get in. But still, um, the fact that they have areas where you, know, you can make people connect with each other, um, it's always a good thing. So it made me realize that ultimately, uh, what makes for good events here isn't the show, or having the number of exhibitors, it's the kind of engagement the attendees get to do with each other and with creators. Um, and that's always a good thing, regardless of whether they fight over, over Superman versus Goku, right. or whether Neil Gaiman is better than J.K. Rowling, or whatever. whatever. It's always about that, and it reflects online. When people argue on Facebook comment sections, it's exactly the, the type of thing that happens in real life, except that in real life, it's more civil, how, I suppose. Yeah, how do you, have you known of people who don't talk to each other anymore because they've argued about, let's say, Batman versus Superman or Star Wars? Like, I'm not talking to this person anymore because it's like, I mean, a political level of, of arguing. Like, people hate each other already because huh. of something, you know, Star Wars. Come to fit. This person likes it, I didn't like it, we fought, yeah. and they said this, and they said this, and they're not my friend anymore. Come to think of it, no, I, I okay. haven't known anyone like that. Having said that, though, I remember back in 2002, I had an online argument with Noel Vera okay. at Pin uh, over at Pinot Exchange over Star Wars. Okay. And he was dismantling, or he was very, very critical of Star Wars and how 
George Lucas treated Star Wars like a documentary when George Lucas should not be should be treating it like a properly structured narrative film. It was it, he had very great points, but at the time I was young, you know, I was new to the message boards, and I was like, no, Star Wars is awesome. George Lucas is God. And every time I do a search on PinoyExchange.com for that discussion, I still see it, and it's there. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I was so stupid. So I haven't been properly introduced to Noel Vera, but I guess when I see him, I guess I'll have to apologize for being that kind of stupid fanboy. But I guess people go through that phase. So yeah, I remember the arguments were very heated back then in message boards because people, I guess, were concentrated in their interests and they tend to be really... Now, in Facebook, you can opt not to take things seriously. Right. But back in the days of the message boards, you tend to take those arguments really seriously. Right. Because right. it's you and other people who share the same interests. Everybody's watching, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, when you get into a nerd fight online, it's like a schoolyard fight because everybody's watching and you have to win at that point. Exactly, exactly. It's not like, like me and Rod arguing about, yeah, it's like you have to prove something. Yeah, and, but these days, since you know, the arguing happens in Facebook and Twitter, everything's so impersonal, so you can opt not to take everything seriously anymore. But, but back to the but original some question. Some people do. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> and sometimes it, do, it. it does stress you out sometimes, you know, the way things happen these days. But back to the, to the concept of how the geek community is here. Um, I guess I observed that, that you know, when we get really argumentative and passionate in social media, um, it used to be just the geeks that were like that. You know, they go to message boards and argue and, and stress themselves out. But uh, now that the concept of the message board has been expanded to everyone through Facebook, now the, 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 the geek fights aren't just reserved for the geeks anymore. They're reserved, they, they now happen to everyone. So now we kind of have a problem Whereas before it used to be a geek problem, now it's everyone's problem that right. everyone's arguing online. Yes, everyone is invested. Online. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, especially I would think now because there's you know Corona and also because we're not able to go out into nature and hike. People yeah, are yeah. just very, and there's traffic. They're very married to their devices and their streaming right. shows. So it becomes such an essential part of life that that you know. They will make a crash landing on you. Like they're so invested. Yeah, yeah. So of course they'll argue. They'll they'll discuss. I mean, it's, pop culture is is it's just huge, especially in the, our urban our urban setting. Okay, Mike, how about the fans over at the? Uh, well, your, d uh, just speaking to Adrian, saying a, a funny little anecdote was uh, I don't know about five or six years ago at the Comic Bug, um, I had an employee named Daniel. And he was very, he was an opinionated nerd, right? So very rarely does Mike get a day off, but I had a day off. <laughs> and uh, I get a phone call from Daniel, and he's like, I need you to come in. I'm like, why, what's up? He's like, uh, there's been a situation. You have to come in. I have to leave. I'm like, oh, shit, everything okay? He's like, it'll be okay, but I have to go. I'm like, all right. So I live really close to the store. So I showed up, and I'm like, what's going on, dude? He's like, well, uh, there was a, a customer here I had to kick out. I'm like, what happened? He said, uh, well, he, he was saying Star Wars Episode One sucked. And I'm like, well, it, it did, d didn't it? And he's like, yeah, but not for the reasons he was saying. <laughs> And so he literally kicked us because Daniel would bring weapons to work. This is the kind of place I run. <laughs> he would bring a knife, and he was worried that he was going to stab a bitch um, because of the reasons that this dude... And by the way, it wasn't just a customer. It was like a guy that worked at another store. So it was like this story went back to the other comic shop. It's like this is what happens, you know. So uh, anyway... Uh, <laughs> I, I relieved Daniel. I was like, okay, go home, dude. Go home. Like, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we, we love this stuff. We love this culture, I think. We get passionate about it. Um, sometimes too passionate. 
But I think what we have to keep in mind is that this is a relief, it's a release, it's a place to go to enjoy, uh, you know, fantasy worlds and things like that. And, you know, we shouldn't fight over this stuff. There's the, there's the actual yes. real shit we can yeah, fight over. Know, there's important we things. We really do, we absolutely do fight over um, our geek things. And a part yeah. of this discussion was like, you know, gatekeeping in that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, um, I've been a fan of this thing longer than you. So I know my, and so yeah, yeah does no, that I mean, happen this, over, I this mean, is supposed to be a luxury, Adrian. like, get, like entertainment, comics, movies, video games. It's supposed to be an escape from reality and it shouldn't be something that you are so invested in that you get angry about shit. You should be angry about the real world, things that are happening in the real world, and this stuff should be fun, you know? I mean, there's plenty, if you pay attention, plenty of things to get angry about. Um, but it's not, you know, that Last Jedi sucked. You know, I mean, Last Jedi could have been better, but... Uh, but huh? <laughs> Like, don't get mad about that, right? Like, you like it or don't like it, but, it, you know, and, and, and we're, we're in this era, I think, where um, we are trying to embrace and engage new, new audiences, uh, women, people of color, people of different sexualities, people of different religions. We want them to be a part of this. And, like, the fact that maybe the new Star Wars trilogy, the main character is a girl, doesn't take away from my experience of like having Han Solo or, or th you know, like, and you can actually enjoy the fact that it's somebody different than, than who you are or what you represent or whatever. Um, I, as, as a comic book dealer, as a comic book retailer, I, I encourage that, like I want, more sort of diverse audiences addressed in, in, our, in our fiction. Um, because I think it's important. I think, uh, I mean, my first comic, um, a, little, a little misguided, a little misguided in hindsight, but my first comic was Mac Afro. And it was basically Shaft meets Star Wars. And it was a vision I had <laughs> in, in a dream but then it was like the, the kind of thing where I looked on the shelves and at that point, this was 2001, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, we had Luke Cage. I don't think there was a Luke Cage, but the only black superhero was, at that time, Spawn. And it was a guy who you covered his face. You don't see his face. And then whenever he tried to turn back to a human, he turned into a white dude. That was kind of his curse. Um, I was like, yeah, we need, and, and I worked in Gardena and I had a lot of, you know, African-American customers. I'm like, why are they, why is nobody making comics for African-American people? Like, you know, not that any character isn't for any audience, but that representation wasn't there. And I always thought that like Star Wars and Star Trek could use a little more funk and soul, you know? So uh, that was, Mac Afro was my first book. Hello, come on in. Hi. What's your name? Hey, come on down. Oh my gosh, hello. Hi. That's how we do it. That's how you build an audience, folks. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> but, uh, and then my, my second book was, uh, it was called Gone South. And it was, uh, the protagonists were two um, vampires, female vampires from New York, hiding in, in the deep south. And again, like, there weren't a lot of comics back then that, that had female protagonists. Plus, I was single and I was trying to get laid at comic conventions. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's beside the point. By the time the book came out, I was practically married. So everybody was safe. Um, <laughs> okay, Karen. <laughs> but anyway, the um, fact of the matter is that, like, um, we do need to not be so set on the, you know, 
sort of the, the, the Captain Kirks, the Han Solos, the Luke Skywalkers. We need to have more representation, more diversity. We need to have a, a, one quick story and then a, a, we'll go to the next topic. But uh, Yeah, um, I'll, I'll let Adrian chime in also on yeah, yeah, what yeah. he feels about the no, um, gatekeeping. Spider-Man is the perfect example. You have Miles Morales, you have Gwen Stacy, Spider-Gwen. But um, I had this uh, customer sign up for a poll. A poll is like when you subscribe to comics. And uh, for the Miles Morales Spider-Man. And uh, so he's like, look, whatever comic shop he was getting his books from, they missed an issue. He didn't get it. He's like, it's really important that I get this book every month. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we got you, dude. He's like, because my son and I, like, you know, like when Miles Morales was created, that was something we read every month together. And he was seeing himself represented as a, you know, a superhero. And, and his name was actually Miles. And this kid died of cancer at like eight years old. He's like, so when that book comes out, like I read it and I feel like I'm with my son, you know, and it's like, shit. You know, I mean, this, this stuff can mean more, you know, I know these are, silly fictional stories, but it can have more power, more weight than any of us have any idea, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I made sure that dude got his Miles Morales every, every month, hell or high water, so, yeah. So, uh, Adrian, what are your, do you think it's uh, decreased or, like, gotten less intense, the gatekeeping, because everyone knows that the key is really to have fun and to be more welcoming? I, I think it's something that everybody is still working on. Um, we, we are living in a time of diversification. And we have to remember, though, na, na this whole... There, there's this myth of the geek. When we say geek, it's always a guy with glasses and socially awkward into comics or video games or whatever. You know, like, there's that, but, but, it, but you have to take note. I, yeah, but you have to take note. I said guy. The, 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 the stereotype, is when you say geek, you think of a guy. You don't think right. of a, a woman. Right. And somehow pop culture has um, actually uh, enabled that stereotype. Of course, stereotypes happen. Stereotypes are real. And we have, we have that, those socially inept guys and it's these socially awkward guys wearing glasses into video games and toys and whatever, and comics and, and, and uh, genre films that have tended to be passionate and loud uh, with their interests. Um, at the same time, um, this, this segment of people that became the popular idea of the geek um, failed to take note of what was happening with women, I suppose, uh, that women were also into it. But uh, because these geek guys weren't into these women, and when these women sort of go into their, tar uh, into their territory, these geek guys would go, hey, this is ours. And that's, that's been the, the battle ever since. But the thing is, but, uh, I, I, I thought women would just be into, uh, sorry, young me thought that women would just be into looking good, or going to parties, or being cool, going for the, the macho, handsome guy. That, 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 that dichotomy of the geek guy versus the, the, the macho guy. I used to think like that. Very binary way of thinking. And then, uh, when I became part of these communities, I met women who were engineers, who were into Star Wars, who were into Harry Potter, who were into Star Trek, uh, who were into comic books or graphic novels, who were into Sandman, like, like Karen. Of course, Karen was one of the earliest women I used to read about who was in, really into Sandman and all that. And I was like, wow, so women like this exist. So uh, I guess you, Karen, were one of the earliest people who indirectly educated me about you know, uh, uh, the, the, the diversity of people in in this geek, quote unquote, right. community. So uh, when, when I met these people, uh, of course, the way communities tend to happen, uh, you realize that, oh, this girl is into Star Wars and I love her and I, want, and, and, and I literally love her and I fall in love with her, blah, 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 blah. And that's how I met 
my wife. And uh, my wife uh, is more of a Star Wars nerd than I am, I realized. She knows the models of certain ships. Of course, of course my wife's there having coffee at the coffee shop outside, doing work, doing sustainability work. But yeah, she, she knows more about Star Wars than I do. And it, I actually enjoy it. The fact that there, uh, there's another person especially a woman who knows more than I do, that I can talk to about it and I could be passionate about my fandom with. And um, I think other people still need to catch up with that notion because um, it shouldn't be about gender, really. It should be about, you should be othering people. It should be, you know, um, placing people into these labels that you're a jock, you're a geek, you're this, you're that. Although I still suffer from that from time to time. And I guess a lot of us still do. Uh, and especially in my case, as, as, a, as a director myself, I do need to create these, uh, these uh, archetypes to tell my stories, but at the same time, I do need to dissociate myself from them. So, uh, so, so yeah, no, um, uh, along with this conundrum in the geek community, I guess when you expand, there's always going to be some pushback. There always will be. In the same way that in the real life, uh, when you try to be more progressive, sorry, I've been watching a lot of the American debates <laughs> lately. It's, it's my thing. I watch The View at midnight here. It's my thing. So, so when, when, uh, when, when, when you try to be progressive, there will always be pushback. In anything, in any organization, any ideology, any change, or that matter, there will always be pushback. And you have to counter that. Uh, with with a push forward of your own, and uh, of course it tends to be really tricky. So that's where the clashes happen. But I think of it in in terms of those clashes need to happen because in those clashes the discourse happens, and when the discourse happens, that's when everybody gets to learn, hopefully or ideally. Okay. Um. What? Okay. Before we wrap up and uh, bring Raphael. Uh, to the stage to discuss um, his art, his Emmy Award winning art for all these animation show. Uh, almost. Almost. Um, I'd want to discuss like, because um, I actually, I'm glad you mentioned the women. They're, you know, the women who I wanted to involve in this dialogue are not here right now, but um, they also still feel that there's still work that needs to be done in that uh, they feel that they are less credible than their male counterparts. Like somebody would say something, but when the same message is delivered by a male or the same work is done by a male, they feel like it's more credible or their abilities in the gaming arena is, you know, oh, she's a girl, I'm, I can be better. But, well, they're not here. I feel bad. Um, it's better so when we hear... It, yeah, but it was a, a guy that said, called her a supporting character. And if anything, she's the driving force of me Thank and you. Raphael being Thank here. You. I, I understand, I, you know. Yeah, Thank no, you. like, like her, her power, her fierce sort of being, like, and her caring nature, like, guys don't have that the way she does. I don't know. You know? And, and I, I'm like, I'm just... Yeah, but it's, it's nice. That means everybody in the community gets to bring something different to the table. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pull them all in. It's, uh, so I would, I would ask um, Adrian and first, then Mike, like, um, before, again, we give the floor over to Raphael. And, who's drawing right now. I yeah, think. who's drawing right now. He's going to talk about his experience working with, on Batman and, and Spider-Man and Justice League. Um, yes. So I would say... Um, uh, what is the most rewarding thing for you because um, you've been able to do things like NextCon and you get people engaged with Nerd Rage, you have people who um, were bummed out that Nerd Fest isn't happening because they're Sorry very that, invested. Guys. So, I mean, what are the rewards for doing all this work? Because, I, I, I mean, uh, this is a labor of love. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, it is, it is for me. In, in, in anything that I do, if, if I'm not really passionate about them, there's really no point. Whether it's a film project or even a commercial project uh, or, or whatever, a graphic design project or, or, or even these things. But 
the, ultimately, the reward for me is just being able to connect. Um, of, of course, uh, being into fandoms, being into communities, they help stimulate my imagination. It helps me come up with more stories or come up with my projects. But the really rewarding thing for me is, yeah, the connection. When I say the connection, <laughs> connections like that. <laughs> but no, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the connection between people, the connection between me and my fellow fans, uh, me and my wife, me and creators, me and my favorite actors. Uh, like, uh, I, I posted this on Facebook the other day. Um, well, we canceled, uh, we canceled Nerdfest for this year. Um, and um, of course, we weren't really keen on announcing who the guests were supposed to be because the point is moot. Um, but uh, I guess I can, I can tell this to everyone because it's out on Facebook. Um, one of the, the biggest guests was going to be Brandon Routh. Um, uh, Superman, Legends of Tomorrow, and all that. And um, I'm a big fan of his version of Superman. Uh, I could relate to him more because I guess we're the same age and, and all that. So the other day, I was watching Michael Rosenbaum's podcast with Brandon Routh as a guest, and they were talking about anxiety and dealing with stress and dealing with failure, like Routh dealt with, dealt with failure after the Superman debacle and all that. And, and I somehow got to relate with my own failures or the events failures or failures in life in general. And I was like, oh, wow, I, 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 I really relate to him again and all that. And I couldn't help it. There's Twitter. I had to tweet the link to the video and I tweeted him my thanks. Because that's, I think at this point in my life, my purpose is to give thanks to my heroes, whether it's, it's um, actors or creators or um, even my musical heroes who I now work with, uh, thankfully. Yeah, I think my, 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 the main point of my existence is to just thank them. So um, I thank Brandon for that. And then I'm sorry that Nerdfest didn't push through. Of course, I was happy to just leave it at that. And then he replied on Twitter. And I was like, ah! <laughs> uh, so he said, yes, we'll make this happen again. And I was like, oh my god. <sighs> I was really crying at home at around 2 in the morning. And my wife was asleep, and I was tempted to wake her up, but she's pregnant, so I didn't want to risk her ire and her, her health. And I was just like, oh my God, he responded to me. And I just had to, to message other friends and all that, and I posted a screen cap, posted it on Facebook. But the point is, yeah, the, my point is just to connect with all these people, the people who have influenced me, the people who have made me happy and made me want to be a better person. Of course, with, with Ralph, he's a, he's, a, he's a Democrat, so it made things easier for me <laughs> to really relate to him. Dean, Dean Cain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but in fairness to, in fairness to Dean Cain, when he was here for ToyCon, he was yeah. nice to me when I asked him a very politically loaded question. And he answered it in a very dignified manner, like a Superman should. And then his Twitter meltdown happened afterwards, so there's that. Well, at, so. least, at least you got him at, at a good... At a good time, yeah. yeah. Oh, but yeah, yeah we can. even connecting like this with you, I, I'm, I'm thankful for finally getting to know you, for being your friend. Because back in high school, I was just like, oh, she's so cool with all these club yeah. tread gigs and all that. Back she's a personality. Day. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, I, used to, I used to be very starstruck when she was around. Or even Hank, who I used to read in magazines, being this cool, long-haired, well, at the time, <laughs> <laughs> handsome man. <laughs> Yeah, people writing articles about him, but who is this Hank Palenzuela? Something like that. So I, I guess I just feel a sense of gratitude even getting to know you guys. I, it, 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 I feel very humble just being with these awesome creators. And, and a lot of these people here in the audience, but I, I, I'm just this guy who's happy to be around everyone. Yes, he is. In fact, um, usually Adrian is a supporter. He's hardly like in front being interviewed. Yeah. Like this, ever. So, yeah, let's, uh, I'll give Adrian a round of applause. This is a very, um, just a rare thing to, be, to grant this interview and to I'm grant a fat this. Boy. I know, but I mean, still, it, it does mean something to us. So, I, well, I'll ask Mike what are, what, again, doing this is also, again, like, it's a labor of love. Yeah, Atomic I mean, basement. So, what are your rewards for doing what? You. you 
Thank you. <laughs> now, a, a, a real quick funny story. Um, we did APCC uh, 2018. And uh, so me and Raph, that's Raphael. We'll ask, by the way, everyone can ask questions and interact. Before we're we're, we we're kind of like the Cheech and Chong of comics, right? So we're like coming in, we're all disheveled. We're like doing our best to get our booth put together. And, and Omi was our neighbor. Omi and uh, Jonathan Lau were our neighbors. You guys know who those guys are? And uh, so we're getting our booth put together and they're like, what are you guys, what is... What is Karen Kunovich doing with you guys? What is she doing being around you guys? <laughs> we're like, it's just our friend. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, and I had no idea. Like, she's like the the Shirley Manson geek girl of comics. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you. You know. So anyway, that's just how she rolls. But I'll tell you what this culture has given me, and it's only everything. It's given me my best friend. It's given Aww, me this brother. person. It's given me the opportunity to be here today with you guys. None of that would happen if, you know, huh? so far, so far, usually. <laughs> it, um, no, but I, I mean, I've, I've been a comic book collector since, again, since my uncle bought me those comics in 1978. Um, I've been a comic book writer since 2001. I've been a comic book dealer since 1993 um so without this culture without comic books I, you know i don't know i don't know what what i would have to live for you know um i mean even even you know my son is a result of me writing a comic book getting it in a store in hollywood getting that optioned getting invited to a party where i met his mom and so i always think about like it's just everything. Comics are every fiber of my being. And, and comics, not just in the form of comics like this, but comics as, as in the form of Guardians of the Galaxy. Where we had our first conversation about uh, Rocket Raccoon. And that was, that was the beginning of you know, a really deep and uh, generous friendship, I would say. You know, and so, and, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for that, who knows? Like, what, do we have something else to connect over? I'm, I'm, I'm going to cry. This is turning out to I'm be really like a very hard trying thing. to make you cry. That's the whole um, point of this. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the audience also. It's like a tough time to be out, like, a, you know, and the news about BGC and Green Hills. Hi, Jovan. Hey, Jovan. It's, uh, hey, sweetie. Yeah, so uh, thank you to the audience. Does anyone have any questions, any comments um, for, okay. Wow, this is for Adrian. Um, do, you, uh, do you get a lot of um, foreign people coming into your shows? Uh, with a what, sorry? Do, do you get a lot of people from overseas coming to your show? Oh, uh, no, just, just because just it's hard to get guests. Attendees. It's hard to get foreign guests here. Because uh, I just mean as attendees or, you know. Ah, to, to the events. Um, yeah. Well, I can speak for, for at least NextCon because that was our, uh, the, lab, the laboratory, the, the Petri dish, the test events. Um, it was hard. Uh, at, we, we didn't think so at first because, of course, uh, Marvel and, and Star Wars and DC films are, are, are all the rage now. But we realized that it's not that easy to bring those people to their to our events, mainly because um, the concept of discourse uh, is, I guess, something I don't think I don't think it's new, but it's not something fully uh, exploited in in local events. Sure, the bigger events have panels and all that, but they're mainly celebrity oriented and not engagement oriented. And what I like about American conventions, especially the small conventions, that any creator can get to, to to present their stuff on stage like this and, 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 and engage with the crowd. So it's really hard to bring people in that sense because people somehow are trying to wrap their heads around the kind of formats of our previous events. But uh, I think by the third year of NextCon, people already knew, oh, okay, this is the type of event. So they started, uh, more people started going. But um, the costs of putting that up 
when you had APCCs and toy cons and other similar events happening, and somehow their formulas were variations of ours with more money. Um, that's why we, we stopped. But at the, at the same time, even if it started bringing people in, ano eh, um, I guess events like this uh, give us or a show or, 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 or serve as proof that we need stuff like this. We need engagement like this. Because this is what makes the community grow. Um, this is what makes creators grow and the audiences grow at the same time. And um, I just hope more events follow suit. I, it doesn't have to be nerd fest. It doesn't have to be my, my events. If anything, I want to go to those events so that I could be that kind of fan asking questions. And um, actually in ToyCon, I'm that guy in every panel in ToyCon that asks the really difficult question. <laughs> And um, only because no one asks it, and I know other fans in the audience want to ask it, but they don't know how to, so I get to be the guy to do that. But I just hope there are more people that do that and more events that encourage that kind of conversation so that everybody becomes richer as a result, I suppose. But thank you for that wonderful question. Does anyone in the audience have a comment? That how do you handle gatekeepers? Oh, that's, that's a... All right, here's the thing. I'll put this out there. Um, from a theoretician's standpoint, I think gatekeeping is a natural consequence of having a community. Uh, when you build a community, when you, when you define lines, there will have to be people standing at the gates to say, um, uh, I guess, um, filter the information, of course, I'm thinking in terms of, say, this, th these gatekeepers can be a website or an organization or a head of an organization. So there's that kind of gatekeeping involved. But then again, there's the interpersonal gatekeeping when, 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 when you say that I'm the better Star Trek fan than you are. Uh, or, or what? You call yourself a Trekkie? I'm a Trekker. Stuff like that. Uh, or I'm the better Superman fan. What does, what does that mean, really? But ultimately, these are just pop culture constructs. These are imaginary things. This, like what you said earlier, this is, it's not real life. It's not even politics. It's, even then, you can argue that politics is also a construct on its own and can easily be you know, chucked away and all that. It all boils down to just being kind, being nice to, to, to other people. And that's what we tend to forget. So in terms of gatekeeping, I guess I notice it, especially in the geek community, that sometimes people get to reach a semblance of stature because you're the president of this fan club or um, movie corporate or film corporations approach you and give you perks. And because you get those perks, uh, you feel superior. It's like social climbing, if you think about it. And any social climber feels superior to other people because he or she gets perks. But again, what do those things all mean? But does it make you a better person? Does it help you contribute to society? Not really. So, so yeah, you my personal gatekeepers, eh, eh. but um, um, yung, yung gatekeeper as a, as a structure, as a necessary construct in a group, I guess, yeah, yeah you can say that they are necessary up to a certain point. So I, I think it's uh, important to uh, acknowledge and empower other voices, other perspectives. And when you see people like Ethan Van Skyver, who's a comic artist, he's a member of uh, Comics Gate. You see these organizations like Comics Gate, they have these sort of uh, passive aggressive ways of trying to silence women and people of color, I think it's important to call that shit out and go after them. And I do. And that's, that's how I think we, you know, make sure that the so-called gatekeepers know their place. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll add something to that again. Um, 
Um, ultimately, in any keepers. Yeah. Ultimately, in any community, gatekeepers only have power that is bestowed on them by their community. Right. So whether it's a website or a personality or whoever, they only get power because people treat them as such. So if you don't treat this person as your leader because you think, suddenly think this person's awful or this person's behaving awful or treating other people awfully, strip the person of that power. You have no power here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and every time you, you, you're, you have a platform or like this, we automatically, from that perspective I was saying earlier, from that um, structural perspective, every time we're here, we're already placing ourselves as gatekeepers of sorts because we're shepherding that discourse. Sorry, I sound like a grad school student, <laughs> which I am. But yeah, that's the perspective. We are gatekeepers right now here. And on certain occasions, some of you guys here tend to be gatekeepers of sorts too. But again, that's, it, it's how we shepherd the people with knowledge and information. But when we other people, when, you, we, when we ostracize people, that's when the gatekeeping turns bad. And we have to take the power away from those people. Right. And uh, yeah, I think going after is like even is putting it mildly. Thank you guys, by the way, Thank for coming. Thank you very much for Listening coming. Listening for hours and, um, and hours uh, to us. Yeah. Blather on. And, um, uh, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Mike. Um, and there's, you know, continued interaction with Mike and the guests and with Raf and with each other. And there's uh, food. So there's we'll, sandwiches there's back sandwiches, there, everybody. Get some sandwiches. And I'm going to take, we're going to take a short break and then we'll have Raf on. Thanks, Rafael guys. Navarro. <laughs> <laughs>